In my view, we have reached an inflection point in the Chinese market, which requires multinationals to reassess their growth and profit expectations, as well as to rethink how to compete in order to win. You are listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of C-Suite Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. C-Suite Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of subjects that matter most to business leaders. I'm Steve Odlin from the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss China's growth forecast for 2024. Joining me today is Alfredo Montefar-Helu, head of the China Center at the Conference Board. Alfredo, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's great to join you. So, Alfredo, we, just does, we have to give some perspective here on China forecasting. You know, economists have forecasted the growth rate in China, the GDP growth rate, and the government has also issued their forecast. And historically, they've not been very close. They've always been, I don't know, what, 200, 300 basis points difference. Now, that's been changing most recently as as the forecasts have been converging. Just give some background on that before we get into 2024. Certainly, Steve. I think that's a very important question to understand uh, the targets that China sets for its growth. If we look back at what at where China used to be, data was very opaque, and that, of course, affected forecasts because forecasts are based on what we can see. And the data opaqueness, of course, affected what we could see. But the most important thing, I think, to consider in terms of why this forecast differed, I mean, the, the forecast that economists do within the target that uh, the states uh, sets, is the fact that unlike market economies, China is a state-led economy. Forecasts really underestimate the ability of the Chinese government to mobilize capital, allocate resources, and basically just achieve the target that they set every year. Again, as a state economy, whenever the government sets its target every March, you you really it's really incredible because you could see how when they set a target of let's say eight percent, seven percent, six percent, immediately the local governments start actually coming up with plans on how to invest to achieve the target. The negative thing is that this ended up exacerbating China's over reliance on investment because it is through investment and credit that governments at the local level achieve those growth targets. Okay, so you said some really important things here. You know, in the in the Western Europe or North America, economists are trying to forecast what will happen in this market-based economy. They don't really know, but you know, it's not it's like a business trying to forecast what will happen. In China, they not only are forecasting it, but they're predicting what will happen and they're setting goals and targets that are then dispersed among the local governments to achieve. So it's like a business setting a plan and and those targets are about a plan rather than just this a forecast from the outside looking in. And so there's a really, really different between the way that, you know a lot of the world does it and the way China does it. And, and that's, you know, at that then, Get to the point of you know what's going on in 2024 because their targets have been lower versus past years. Right. Um, so I think that despite the fact that China as a state sets the targets and this mobilizes resources to achieve those targets, fact of the matter is that the Chinese economy has been slowing down over the past decade, uh, which is really normal for economies that continue maturing, right? Um, and I think that's something that the government has considered in its targets and projections. Now, let's be let's be clear. When the government sets a target, it's a whole work. So you have the government asking experts in universities, even from foreign companies, to come up with their own uh, recommendations on how to achieve their uh, development priorities on the state of the economy. They really listen to that in order to set the target. But that does not uh, mean that the ultimate goal, which is really mobilizing resources and directing the economy in the way that achieves the development priorities, it, it, it doesn't happen. So what I mean to say is that despite all of the studying, all of the uh, the, the advice that they get, they, they are still doing this in a very much state economy way. So very different from a market economy. 
Okay, great. So that that's very helpful. So a, as we then look, you know, a couple of years ago, China was growing close to eight percent at one point, double digit rates. Now the the growth rate for twenty twenty four is what? So the growth rate for twenty twenty four, according to what they just said last week, it will be around five percent. That's something right. that the government said, but forecasts vary, right? So uh, it they vary from four point four to five percent, really. Uh, our own forecast is uh, 4.6, which is in line with what the IMF has said for this year. So the IMF also does not expect that China will reach their target of 5% or around 5% this year, which okay. is really the, the, the same target as last year. So it's it's going to be difficult. Okay, so there's a target of 5%, but most economists are predicting that they won't be able to achieve that. Okay, so now we go to your, your point about the investment, because China has been driving that growth over time by flooding their internal market with capital, building everything they can build, developing an export manufacturing base, all of those kinds of things. But things have changed now. Absolutely. So um, for any market that is developing and emerging, I think that uh, if you look at the story or, or, or at the history of Latin America and the history of Southeast Asia, it's very clear that the first stages of development are about industrialization, about investment on the supply side, about production, about exports. That's the same path that China followed, but really state directed. Um, the problem is that at some point across all of these economies, there are pressures because investment does not generate the same growth as it used to before. And so the pressures are for these economies to start transitioning to a consumption led economy right now. The examples of Latin America demonstrate that if they are not successful in that, in that transition, they fall in what we call the middle income trap. China right now is undergoing that transition. And that is the problem because the investment uh, led economy is not generating the growth dividends that they expect and that the government has been used to uh, leverage in order to achieve their targets. So right now, of course, uh, they are also trying to um, try to guide this transition in a way that also achieves their strategic goals. Now, you know, China is a little different um, than a lot of countries in that they're the second largest economy in the world. And but for a long time, they were trying to attract maximum amounts of foreign direct investment, even as they had the, the Belt and Road initiatives where they were providing for their own foreign direct investment in places like Africa and and around the world, they were trying to attract it. That seems to have slowed down now. Definitely. So um, let me first touch the point about China's ODI. So definitely the Belt and Road has been kind of like the key initiative of China that propelled investment from China to other countries. That has diminished in great part because China itself saw this as a kind of a risk, right? A lot of these investments were actually fueled by debt. And the investments were made in assets that really uh, didn't pay too much attention to the return of this investment. So actually, the Chinese government at some point decided that this has to slow down. And you saw a lot of divestments overseas. And China has also diminished the amount of financing that it gives to Belt and Road projects. Um, but let me stop there on ODI. Let's talk about FDI into China. Yes, over the past year, over the past two years, actually, FDI has dropped. FDI meaning foreign direct investment. So uh, other countries investing the money into China. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Foreign investment into China has decreased markedly. But you know, when I talk with some of uh, the bank CEOs here in China, they have told me that a lot of that decrease has been because companies are moving their liquid capital out of China due to interest rates, right? So during COVID, actually, China's interest rates were quite high compared to other countries. And so there was a lot of capital that actually was uh, flowing into China to make a return. Now that capital is moving out because China's interest rates are going uh, are, are not as high as, as other geographies, of course. Uh, so that explains part of the story. But of course, uh, another part of the story is that there are some companies that are divesting from China or are uh, shifting supply chains away uh, of China to other countries in order to increase the resilience of the global operations. 
in great part because of how the market is doing, because of uh, the economic, sorry, the economic slowdown, and also the geopolitical tensions. Yeah, this geopolitical tension is is not to be, you know, understated. Although that's not the purpose of of our conversation today, because I think a lot of companies have found almost their entire ch supply chain sitting in China, and you know, with with the you know various discussions around geopolitics, they've said, "Oh, is that smart?" And a lot of investor investors in Western companies have said, "You know, you really should diversify your supply chains. You know, have plants." You know, in the local areas and so forth, and so you've seen that chips um, as, as well. So there is some of that uh, going on as well. Absolutely. I mean, the geopolitics are only one part of of, of the equation, right? Yeah. I mean, um, if you look at what companies were heading towards, so even before uh, the uh, the pandemic, companies were already thinking about vulnerabilities in their supply chains. One of the key vulnerabilities is. Uh, concentrating the production of one key component in one geography. If something happens to that, not only because of tensions, but because of what we saw, the pandemic, right, uh, of uh, climate risk, uh, natural disasters, something happens, then that stops uh, all the operations of the business. They cannot sell, they cannot produce. So diversifying to other geographies makes sense. Yeah. So you so now you have foreign direct investment kind of on the downward slope. It doesn't mean that people that companies aren't investing there. It just means that the trend is 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 declining. The level of investment rate is declining. Okay. So that's a that's a a you know a headwind for China on the growth side. So therefore, China needs to look more internally. Talk about the levers that they have internally to drive their growth. Well, I mean, uh, that's definitely. Consumption, on the one hand, domestic consumption, also investment, and uh, exports, right? But uh, let me just go to exports first. The global economy is not performing uh, as well as it used to, and so external demand for China-made products has gone down. So that, as a driver of growth, uh, is not as important. As a matter of fact, over the past decade, exports has decreased in importance compared to domestic consumption. Now, investment continues being important. But as I mentioned before, the growth that is generated through investment has decreased. Decremental gains, right? Um, so it really is a story about consumption. Now, the problem is that during the pandemic, almost three years of zero COVID restrictions, concurrent to that, you have a property downturn. That really hurt confidence levels, right? And these confidence levels have are very weak, and this has persisted since then, demonstrating that what's really pulling growth down in China are structural imbalances. And if China does not solve these structural imbalances, which I tend to say, well, when people ask me what is necessary for China to actually just transition and to continue growing as it was before, the simple answer I give is like, you have to reduce people's need for precautionary savings. Very easily said, but very, very difficult to achieve. And so that's the uh, structural imbalance, the key structural imbalance for China. That's what's really uh, making it difficult for them to transition to a consumption-led economy. So those three divers really um, are all not performing as before. Add to that the fact that China's uh, population is aging very rapidly. That's actually on the long term is the key, uh, the key headwind, I think. Okay, and I'm going to come back to um, to follow up after the break on the real estate portion of it. But the uh, the Chinese government just had their National People's Congress. We, you know, and, and this is where you know they discuss all of these things. Any other points uh, that came out of that 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 struck you? Right. So uh, just very quickly on 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 the economic growth. Uh, as I said, it's going to be very difficult for uh, for China to achieve this growth of around five percent they are no longer benefiting from a low base. Also, it's very hard to think how China is going to increase from 0.2% CPI in 2022 to 3% this year. This would require massive demand, and that requires a recovery in confidence levels. And I'm not seeing how, how that's going to happen. Um, another key takeaway is that um, while national security and economic development are being treated as interdependent, 
uh, actually national security is still prioritized. And we could see that uh, when the government focused more on this, this idea of new productive forces, which is a term that refers to new technologies necessary for China's innovation-led growth and industrial upgrading. I mean, this is good. This is good to increase productivity. It's good for China's transition to a high value of the economy. But really, the emphasis is being driven in great part by national security and national economic security considerations. Uh, building technological self-reliance, especially in emerging sectors, has risen to the top of China's policy agenda as a cornerstone of overall national strength. And so one has to wonder, that's the focus, that's very good from an economic perspective, but really what you should be paying attention to is demand, is actually alleviating uh, the confidence weakness, trying to find a way to convince people to spend more and stop saving. The final takeaway is power centralization. So what we saw at the National People's Congress is uh, that the Congress passed a new law granting more powers to the party over the state council. The state council is uh, China's cabinet in charge of overseeing central government agencies and ministries. So um, with the added language really uh, makes the state council, uh, of, you know, it's subject to resolu uh, the world is resolutely upholding the authority of the party central committee and resolutely implementing its decisions and plans. So okay. right there, you see that they have been turned into an operating arm of the party. So really very, very, very centralized. So that those would be the takeaways. We're talking about the 2024 growth in China. We're going to take a short break and be right back. What does the future of work mean for your employees? How will your company navigate ESG? Will there be a global recession? At the conference board, our experts translate the latest research and economic analysis into insights and real-time problem solving for your organization. Membership at the conference board provides your team with an assortment of knowledge from economics, marketing and communications, ESG, public policy, and human capital. As a member, you'll have access to our center experts, member-exclusive events, data and benchmarking tools, and peer sharing that will help you understand the present and shape the future. Consider becoming a Conference Board member today by visiting www.conference-board.org. Welcome back to C-Suite Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin from the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Alfredo Montefar-Hellu, the head of the China Center at the Conference Board. Okay, so Alfredo, we got to come back and talk about the real estate situation. You talked about consumption and you talked about investment, but one of the primary areas of investment internally in China over the years have been uh, for real estate. And a lot of that has been to support the growth. You know, if you just think about uh, the, you know, the U.S. is viewed as a big, it's a number one economy in the world. It's a big country, but there, there are only about 10 cities in the U.S. with a million people or more. China, by comparison, has 113 cities with a, a million people or more, 10 times, more than 10 times the level. Same thing in, the, in Western Europe. They're building whole new cities that house a million people apiece. So this is like building a whole new Dallas, Texas uh, or or Houston, or Jacksonville. I mean, the whole cities that they're building in order to house the population growth. That has been an enormous amount of investment you know, over the past couple of decades. Now things are slowing a little bit. You mentioned the population now starting to, to taper off. You know, the one-child policy fed that for a long period of time. So the whole real estate situation has changed, and this is creating a bit of a drag on the Chinese economy. Talk to us about that. Right. Uh, so to understand the real estate situation, we really need to look at the drivers behind that, right? And so over the past decades, under the state-led economy, where investment was one of the main ways by which they achieved growth, we saw an unrestrained expansion of property in China. On the demand side, this was driven by the attractiveness of property as an investment asset in a market that offered no other viable investment channels to people. And on the supply side, of course, facilitated by a business model where developers maintain their cash flows through copious amount of credit and by selling new houses years before completed to generate cash from buyer's deposit. Now, these two factors ended up generating 
a um, a problem of oversupply of housing in China, right? A problem that right now is one of the main drags of the economy because real estate over the past uh, decades actually ended up contributing to 25, from 25 to 30 percent of GDP growth in China. Also, estimates uh, suggest that it over 30 percent of the revenue of local governments came from land sales to developers. And then over 70 percent of Chinese households of wealth was in housing assets. So you can imagine that with the downturn that the property sector is currently experiencing, prices going down, investment going down, construction going down. Well, this is having a very, very bad uh, impact on the overall economy. Yeah. So, so, the, the, but this is, I, you know, as I look at this thing, yeah, you've got, you know, you've got the population contributing to that. Yeah, you've got geopolitics. Yeah, you've got export. You know, da 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 da. da everything we've talked about. But this seems to me to be the key point here for the next few years in China, because you know this was debt driven, as you said, it's a highly leveraged environment. And now they, you know, that they, they simply don't have the demand. They've overbuilt. They've got hugely leveraged companies. They've got companies failing here. They've got empty high rises that they that they've built, and so they're going to have to really throttle this back at the same time when they really want more growth internally. Well, and, and that's the conundrum, right? Because to be fair, what they did, what they did uh, at the start of 2020, is that they saw a very huge problem in real estate. They knew there was a problem for many years. And finally, the government decided to do something about it. They decided to do an aggressive deleveraging of the sector, which really was needed. But this led to a severe liquidity crunch for developers, a series of the defaults. We saw all of them in the news. And a fall, as, as I said, in sales, price, and investment. Now, unfortunately, the timing of all of this was not the best because at the same time, we had COVID. So COVID, property downturn, it really, really accelerated the growth slowdown in China and really made it clear that there, is, there are these structural imbalances that China needs to solve in order to continue growing. Okay, so the, the, the whole world, but the whole world is nervous about this because the last time we saw an over leveraging of a, of a property market in the West, it led to the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. You started, and then you started to see financial institutions go out as a result of that and so forth. Is that something that could happen here? Right, the question of whether China will experience its Lehman moment. And I think that uh, this is not going to, cap to happen for two main reasons. Firstly, is that the country's banking sector is not facing a liquidity crisis. So the developers are facing a liquidity crisis, but the banking sector is not. And the government has the tools and has demonstrated to have the willingness to step in if there are any signs of a liquidity crunch. Plus, you also have to consider their foreign exchange reserves. So that's also very good in terms of cushioning any kind of impact. But the second reason is that uh, we do not expect a massive wave of foreclosures for, for, two, for two other reasons. Um, first of all, the down payment ratio in China until very recently was very high. So typically greater than 30% in first uh, for first home purchasers and even higher, reaching 80% for second home buyers. And the second reason is that mortgages in China are full recourse loans. So if the proceeds of the sale of a foreclosed property are not enough to pay the outstanding mortgage balance, the defaulting borrower remains liable and can even be taken to court by the bank. So all of this reduces the risk that households will stop paying their mortgages. And therefore, that's why we don't think that it's going to generate a Lehman moment. OK, well, I feel a whole lot better now because, you know, I think the, uh, you know, the risk of this whole situation was it, it drove another global financial crisis. You're saying that's not going to happen due to structural reasons, which is great. So therefore, we're back to China's internal growth rate because the, the net effect is that it's going to slow the amount of investment in real estate. And you said this sector has been driving 25 to 30 percent of the growth over the past decade. That's now going to dry up at least for a period of time until things normalize again. Exports are, are moving the wrong way. So therefore, the only lever left is consumption. Talk about that. Exactly. And so just to, to go back to the property thing, 25 to 30 percent of growth 
if that goes down to let's say 10 15 percent of growth which is in line with other markets then the question is what will compensate for that loss of growth and so of course it has to be consumption but not not on real estate it has to be consumption in, in something else but the problem is that the key challenge that the economy faces right now is confidence weakness confidence weakness because Again, because of the pandemic, because of the restrictions, because of the real estate downturn. And this has led people to have uh, more propensity to save money and to spend less because of precautionary reasons. So they are concerned about their uh, financial security, about their job security, and therefore they want to save more of their money. We're also seeing a phenomenon that we call consumption downgrading, which is people are spending less than before on similar items. And this is actually pushing the competition to win uh, the Chinese consumer to lower price points. And therefore, her, uh, the market is just becoming more competitive and harder, uh, more difficult for foreign companies because they're facing stiffer competition from Chinese alternatives. But the point is that if China wants to have an increase of consumption of spending levels, they need to do something to alleviate the reasons or the underlying uh, constraints to confidence, right? And so far, at least from what we saw at the National People's Congress, we haven't seen any very clear policy as to how they're going to do that. And that's why we think that demand will continue on the softer side, at least for the, 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 the short term. But the Chinese consumer has money. And, you know, if the Chinese government pushes it, you know, they, they can be, they can, you know, not be forced, but be encouraged to spend. All right. So then that leads to the question, final, you know, the final subject is what should multinational companies do? So uh companies that are trying to do business in China, how should they view this domestic market, this slowdown uh as impacting their business? What should they be doing differently? In my view, we have reached an inflection point in the Chinese market, which requires multinationals to reassess their growth and profit expectations as well as to rethink how to compete in order to win. At the same time, insofar as MNCs think about how to strengthen the resilience of their global supply chains and operations, you know, investments in other regions will be considered. But there is no question that the Chinese market uh, will continue being very important for global competitiveness, especially given the level of sophistication of its industrial ecosystem, to which I don't see an alternative in the world so far. So there, is, there has to be a recalibration of the strategies and more and more of the companies I talk to here in China, they're actually talking about the need to defend their China market, market shares. Some of them tell me that they have really reassessed their strategies on how they go about approaching the consumer, on how they go about uh, addressing the market, how they leverage, for example, data, how they leverage new business models, and how they use Chinese innovations in order to grow in China. So that's something that they are doing more and more. Yeah, but it says that there's an opportunity here that's not unlike how multinationals do business in any country, which is we really need to understand the local consumer, the local demand. So multinationals need to not just view China as a place to manufacture for other markets. Yeah, some of that, but to focus on over a billion people, what a 1.3 billion people, and that market in total, a rising middle class, clearly a very wealthy uh, upper class, and opportunities within. And that's honestly no different than how multinationals approach every other country in the world. So it's a huge opportunity. And I, that thing that you said at the end, Steve, is exactly what I have been hearing when I talk to banks here and other professional service firms, which is like the way you see the market has to change and has to be the same as you see other markets where actually the, the, the growing depends on you competing to get those market shares. Not, it's not just being here and riding the wagon of China's growth. It's just really competing. Um, now, Let's be clear, despite the challenges that China is facing, um, we have seen other emerging markets that have also experienced economic down cycles across their economic history. Now, China China right now, I think, has uh, is experiencing an economic down cycle, but there is opportunity. And if you, if you look at the size, at the overall size of China's economy, so if you look at GDP on nominal terms, you will see that China's 
economy right now, the size of it is 27% larger than 2019. So it has continued growing. So there is still opportunity. How to win has changed. How to compete has changed. So that's something that MNCs need to consider in their, in their future operations here in China. Okay, well, we're going to leave it there. Alfredo, thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you, Steve. It was a great pleasure. You have been listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. 